And in particular, if you look at this Carlsberg bottle, to come back to that, which is really a fun product to look at. We've seen so far for consumers, they really like to be seen with that bottle because you can see from the visibility, it also looks like something that is really sustainable. And I think ultimately that is what this is all about, is also making sure that you translate such an invention into something that's tangible, visible, and that's ultimately going to convince people. On today's Tech Talks, we're thinking back to yesterday, because yesterday was World Earth Day, and we're having a conversation all about plastics with the Avantium CEO, Tom Van Aken, who's going to tell us why we actually need plastics. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast brought to you by myself, David Savage, powered by the Harvey Nash Group, where we talk to leaders from across the industry and bring you some technology news. Joining me today, we've got Haley. It is World Earth Day today. It's not now World Earth Day as this is going out, but the 22nd of April is World Earth Day. So happy World Earth Day, Haley. Happy World Earth Day. And we love it. We love you, Earth. Yeah. We love the Earth. Well, we don't. That's the problem. Too many of us definitely don't love the Earth. Yeah, I know. We've taken advantage of the Earth for a very long time, haven't we? Education is uh, yeah. only really just like coming out real, really about it in the last 10 years on how to look after it. What's really disappointing is with the pandemic, there are all those images of pollution levels dropping in the atmosphere and people taking photos going, look at the sky across London. It's so clear. I can see for miles. And it just feels like everyone's gone, ah, sod that. Get back to normal. Pollution yeah. levels going back up. And all those bits where we were like, we're going to learn lessons from this and it's given the planet a breather. And no, no, we're just going to carry on, apparently, it seems. I mean, hopefully, the fact that Joe Biden is now in the White House, he's, he's coming out and he's trying to reduce carbon emissions in the States by 50% and trying to yeah. rebuild America's reputation after four years of what the fuck was that. But um, <laughs> it's, it's still like, we really need to do something pretty immediately. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like this, if this wasn't an opportunity, then when, when is? Do you know what I mean? Like this yeah, after, the, after happened, on the back of a global pandemic, yeah. you think that is, that is the moment to jolt us into action. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, so look, that's the tone of today's podcast. And our guest is Tom Van Aken, the CEO of Avantium. So we'll hand over to that. You'll see how that ties in beautifully to the topic of conversation. And we'll come back and we'll have a chat about it afterwards. Joining me today, uh, all the way from Amsterdam, is Tom Van Aken. I don't know if I said all the way. I live in, in Kent. It's probably about 60 miles away. <laughs> how are you today, Tom? Very well, David. And uh, thank you. Yeah, nice to be on the show. So very quickly, Tom, you're the CEO of Avantium. If anyone hasn't heard of Avantium, who are you? Yes, David. We are uh, Avantium is a technology company in renewable chemistry. So we use basically... Um, renewable forms of carbon, so plants, CO2, as a feedstock for making chemicals and making plastics. And um, so, yeah, this is, uh, I think, a very good topic for, you know, all the intention on climate change, on plastic waste. Uh, this is exactly the, the world that, um, that we're playing in. Forgive me, because I am totally ignorant and probably should know this, but how is what you're doing different from traditional manufacturer of, of, of plastics? Well, a typical um, plastic is made from petroleum or it's made from fossil resources. It's used one way and then it's thrown into the bin and it goes into um, incinerator or actually it ends up in nature. Uh, I think the future of, uh, of plastics is that we use renewable forms of carbon, so plants or CO2 or waste. Uh, we convert that into a plastic where you have to use less plastic and subsequently after it's been used, you make sure you can use it again and again and again. And if it ends up in an, uh, the, um, the hands of a consumer that is not so environmentally conscious that we throw it into nature, we want to make sure that these products do not accumulate in nature, but ultimately are degraded and uh, and disappear by nature, cleaning it up uh, by itself. So it's a, it's a really dramatically different way of looking at how we make, use, and discard plastics from what we're doing today. And so these plastics are biodegradable. They, they, they break down. So that if, if someone was to be 
unfortunately have one of these products um i noticed on your on your linkedin page there's a picture of a heineken bottle i think or cosberg it's one of one of the is it heineken it's one of the it's one of the big uh, beer companies it is cosberg yeah Carlsberg. Um, so, so someone, someone's kind of in the summer, they've got some Carlsberg, it's in one of your bottles. Maybe they don't know that, but then they just go and throw it away. This will break down uh, in, a, in a roadside or in, in Parkland and, and not cause damage to the environment? Well, uh, David, I don't want to give anyone the permission to litter because I don't think that's no, the, of that's, not. The, that's the, not the right way to actually go about this. But you're very right. The The, the plastics we're using today basically stay in the environment for hundreds and hundreds of years. While well, the material that we're making, PEF, is a plastic that actually um, degrades 100, 100 times faster than um, traditional plastics. So, which means that in a few years time, bacteria and microorganisms, they will basically um, eat that plastic and, uh, and make it go away. So um, that's a completely different material than what um, consumers are used to. But actually, it's one of my fears is that people will th think that they can litter. Um, I really want them to return the bottle so we can use it for making another bottle and making another bottle. Um, mm -hmm. So that is what we have to do really well is communicate that well to the consumer is that recycling is much more sustainable than throwing things into nature. So um, I suppose the, uh, the thing that, that kind of makes me First of all, the, the big question is why? Why continue to make plastics as opposed to you know you got you, you you're you're hearing now increasingly about supermarkets kind of no plastics and they're offering kind of you either bring your own bags or there's paper bags or there's whatever else. Why why do we still need plastics? Why can't we switch over to to other forms of packaging and and you know cardboard or whatever and, and that be our solution? Yeah, I've I've heard this romantic um, story about a plastic-free uh, economy a number of times. You know, I hear it over and over again. But the issue, uh, David, is if you would do that, the, um, the 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 food waste would actually go up dramatically because most of the materials we're using to package, uh, you know, food and beverages are not there just from a marketing perspective, but they're most importantly there to actually protect the product and give it the shelf life that is required. Uh, so if you look at PEF, it has very uh, high barrier um, properties. So it means basically if it's carbonated, the carbonation stays inside. But if it is something that is sensitive to air, it actually keeps the air outside. And therefore, the shelf life is, is extended and therefore you reduce food waste. So I think the worst thing we can do actually is um, think about a world without plastics, but where the, plas the, the food waste problem actually becomes... Um, much more, uh, much worse than where it is today. So I think it is something we have to think about how we can solve these things hand in hand, talking about different materials that we're going to be using to provide, let's say, the value of um, of protecting the food and giving it the shelf life that is required. So what's, how are you, how are you going about getting these plastics out into into the supply chain? Is it a case of of going to companies like Carlsberg and going, look, you, you can have an alternative form of packaging here, which which is going to go down well with with more sustainably conscious or, or, or kind of people who are thinking about the planet in their choices minds. Um, and is there also a cost element? You know, how, how expensive is this plastic to produce versus traditional forms of plastic? Yeah, David, in that sense, uh, it doesn't happen that often that uh, companies bring a new plastic material to the market. You know, you have to go back decades when uh, it was the last time that a new plastic material actually came to the market. So it is something which is, um, I find actually to be um, much more difficult than what we anticipated at the beginning. So um, it, it really involves bringing the whole value chain there. So sourcing the sugars that we use or sh basically sourcing our feedstock from uh, from farmers, um, converting that into this new plastic material, subsequently going to the companies that provide the packaging solutions, convincing the brand owners and the retailers to uh, embrace a new, um, a new packaging solution. So in that sense, it is really something that uh, it, it requires a lot of convincing the nice thing is that we have a material which is um, creates significantly lower carbon emissions, about um, 60, 70 percent lower carbon emissions, and it is something which is fully circular, so it can be recycled. 
but also a product with very good performance properties. So there is a lot of excitement in the industry. Wherever we go and we show the bottles that we make, we get a very warm welcome because people see immediately the value it can bring and the benefits it can bring and, and that it can also bring to consumers. So we generally get a lot of interest, um, but you're very right. And then what about price? Well, as, as any new product in the beginning, this is going to be more expensive than current products, which are sort of commodity products. And uh, over time, when we go up and, and, scale, and scale production, the, the cost will come down. And ultimately, it's going to be a very cost competitive production. But in the beginning, of course, this material is going to be more expensive than um, products like PET or other plastics that are out there. That is inevitable. So in terms of in terms of the adoption then of this, whilst it is at a slightly higher price, is that going to be driven by consumer behavior? You know, are, 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 are companies kind of giving a, a, a choice and saying, um, I suppose if I, if I think about um, a well-known ketchup brand, you can go into the shop and they've got them in, in, in plastic bottles and they've got them in glass bottles. And we always try and make sure that we buy them in the glass bottles because we go, well, that's, that's slightly better than buying it in a plastic bottle. Is it that kind of choice that consumers can make that will then drive a corporation's behavior and, and the choices that they make when they're packaging and distributing a product? Well, um, of course, uh, if you look at the brand owners, I think they are very well convinced about um, the need to go to, to adopt new innovative technologies to basically cut their carbon emissions and to do something about plastic waste because that is really driving uh, the behavior and, and the of, of consumers, and in particular, young consumers are very, very critical in this. Um, the difficulty, of course, is there is a massive amount of information, but also a lot of you know misinformation about this. For example, this glass bottle, many people think that is better than the plastic bottle. But if you look at it from a carbon footprint, probably the plastic bottle would actually score better in um, and if you compare it like for likes with uh, with the glass bottle. But what we as a technology cannot do is actually basically dominate that communication. That is something really where we have to work with brand owners and providing uh, the consumers with choices where they can see that they can make more conscious and more sustainable um, purchasing decisions. And I have a lot of faith in the young consumer who is very much driven by this, who is concerned about this and puts pressure on the brand's owners to to change and to adopt new materials and new solutions that are going to provide, um, yeah, a, a solution when it comes to plastic waste and to uh, and to climate change. So, what what are the plans for the business looking forward? I mean, how do you get the product out to the market in 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 a real kind of mass scale? And 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 how you know are you able to keep up? I suppose the answer is probably you, you will say yes, but how are you managing to keep up with, with, with the level of demand as it grows, right? Well, the first thing we have to do, David, actually, if you're, if you're bringing a new material to the market, is build a large manufacturing plant where we can make this, uh, make this material. And that's what we're going to be doing in the north of the Netherlands. And that plant is going to open 2023. We have been able to actually sell out uh, the majority of the plant already to, um, you know, companies, brand owners, to bottling companies to companies in, that are making these type of packaging. So um, I think that there is a tremendous commercial uh, momentum for us. And now we have to basically uh, convert that into also uh, a product that's on the market that can be uh, purchased by consumers where they can basically uh, vote by, by buying this material. And that will ultimately, of course, drive other brand owners to be adopting the material as well. And that's basically how we foresee that this snowball is really going to, um, to gain momentum. Um, and of course, requiring larger skill plants, more plants around the globe, and ultimately the material becoming uh, the standard packaging material of the future. But that is something that will take time. And that, of course, is the, the big challenge for the company is to make sure that we're patient um, and that we are very persistent in terms of bringing this this new material to the market. That's not easy, but I think uh, given the um, the enormous commercial um, success that we have um, been achieving over the past uh, the past time, it shows you that this is where the sector is going. And I'm very excited to know that this is going to come to your supermarket in the coming years, and that you can 
that you can buy it yourself and that you can test it for yourself if this is something that you think is the right type of solution for the issues that we have. Mm. Look, the last question that I wanted to ask you is how do you get around the cultural, I suppose, challenge that if we think about it, um, increasingly we hear no plastics. You know, um, people are told to, to make the choice to move away from plastics. And I suppose what you're doing is is adding a slightly new element to that argument by saying, hey, not all plastics are created equal. Yeah. But that might be quite a challenge, right? Getting getting that argument across in the current climate. Yes. And, you know, uh, David, I think in that sense, uh, there are two, two answers to that question. One is I'm a firm believer that the uh, the consumer will ultimately really look at, um, at data and at... Um, at facts, and in that sense, uh, it helps that I'm I'm a scientist myself uh, by by training. So, I very much believe you first need to have your facts in order, and then subsequently, it's all about communicating them. And as a technology company, we will never be able to really, let's say, um, tip that balance. But by working with companies, major brand owners, by other companies in this space, I think that we can get that message across to consumers. And in particular, if you look at this Carlsberg bottle, to come back to that, which is really a fun product to look at, we've seen so far for consumers, they really like to be seen with that bottle because you can see from the visibility, it also looks like something that is really sustainable. And I think ultimately that is what this is all about, is also making sure that you translate such an invention into something that's tangible, visible, and that's ultimately going to convince people. Look, I think what you're doing is is fascinating and interesting. Um, I hope that the the plant uh, that you're building continues to to gather speed and that, that more people are aware of the product that you're putting out there. If someone was to find want to find out more about Avantium, how might they do it best? Well, if they go to our website uh, Avantium.com, we are you know I think widely covered uh, in newspapers and on social media. So I'm sure you will be able to find us. The material we've been talking about is PEF. And uh, I really look forward to 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 bring it to um, to all of your listeners to their supermarkets and uh, look forward to get their response once they've been able to uh, to test it. Well, look, thank you very much for your time this morning and uh, well, this afternoon, not rather looking at the time now, but uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, David. First of all, the point that we need plastics because with no plastics, we have more food waste. And of course, plastics elongate shelf life was totally lost on me until Tom pointed it out. I agree. And I just think he's he's actually got such an amazing point across that, that there's good and bad in everything. Obviously, I think that plastics is a, very much the majority bad, but it is long lasting, durable, you know, reduces like, so for instance, even so like if on even on like transporting goods, it's, it's less weight. It's compared to like glass and things like that, so it does come into play with with benefits. But yeah, there is obviously a much bigger picture. But I know I, when he said that, I was like, oh yeah. And then I started thinking about all these other things. Like, oh gosh, of course, that's what it's going to be better for. There's actually positive to it, but I think we just abuse it, don't we? Well, I think I think we're often kind of quite culpable of of oversimplifying this issue around mm. environment. You know. Um, so we kind of go, conspiracy, meat's bad, be a vegan, that's good for the environment. And yeah. then you discover that almond milk uses a horrendous amount of water to produce. Um, and in this, it's like plastics are bad, no plastics. Oh, hang on a minute, food waste is going to go up through the roof. Like we can be a little bit reactionary. We, we know that we need to change, we know that we need to make a difference. But lurching from one extreme to another could quite possibly cause extra issues because you hadn't thought through what you're trying to do. So therefore, the the discovery that there's this new version of plastic PEF that's made from plants that breaks down 100 times quicker, but still gives you the ability to not suddenly have a massive food waste problem is a really sensible and um, pragmatic um, approach to the problem. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And it's one that it's like, wow, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's like, I love that all these things are coming out about, because that's completely renewable and sustainable, isn't it? That it's been used with plants and things like that. So it's much mm. more long-lasting solution to, to the issue. 
Had you had you even I, I hadn't heard of this beforehand. I'm never. assuming I'm not alone. No, never. I was actually str- still after the podcast, I was still struggling to work out what was going on. I was like, hold on, what's he what was I thinking? What has he created? This is amazing. I was like, this is great. Like, all the reasons behind it. And I was but I was like, wow, I had to like do a little bit of research on it. P E F. Yeah, P E F. Uh, how much i mean he talks about the fact that the new product is expensive so consumers putting pressure on on brand owners is important it was in like how much i was just going to say like how much when you're buying stuff like i i I gave that slightly misinformed example where it's like plastic bottle over glass bottle and Tom told me why that was possibly slightly naive, but how much how much thought do you put into your purchases? I mean, if you're buying clothing, is it like, you know, I don't buy anything from say like a, a men's alter, a, a alternative to like Boohoo because you know that it's really bad in terms of the way that they produce cotton because it's cheap and it's disposable and it's that whole like wear it once, throw it away type stuff. I'd rather mm-hmm. have a few um, items of clothing that are high quality that I'll wear over and over. Yeah, I agree. And I think that although there is awareness on plastic and recycling and and that sort of thing, I want to know, I feel like this is something that people should know, because I I don't think we do know enough about what is the right choice to make. What should we be choosing? Because I would have always said the same thing as you, like boss glass bottle is going to be better over a plastic bottle. Because you can recycle it and so on. Like, yeah, so there was just, I've got questions on that that I want to, like, find out, do you know? So I feel like it's awareness. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's definitely an education piece, yeah. Around clothing, we've kind of been educated. We kind of get it. We kind of know mm. how to make smarter, more sustainable choices. <clears throat> when it comes to packaging, I assumed naively it was paper or glass, not plastics. And then you discover that actually there are knock-on effects to those choices and that not all plastics are created equal. Yeah, definitely. And even like with my brand. So I started um, with my cosmetic brand, I started using the bottles in a glass bottle because that is the most cost effective way for me to do it on a small scale. But eventually in my plan would be to have it in a a more sustainable plastic if, if that is a more sustainable option. So like hearing that was a bit like, oh my gosh, wow. And then obviously it's lighter. So if you're ordering it and it's getting it's getting transported to you, it's a lighter option. And there's so many things that kind of benefit. Um, but you just don't think about that. You don't think plastic is going to be plastic over glass. You just don't hear that, do you? But I no, think I... everything's in such excess, isn't there, in, across the world. So it's just like, if you've got so much at your fingertips, cost is such a big element of it. And it's just, we need to know more. I love that he talks about the fact that you've got to turn that invention as well into something tangible and visible and that, you know, the, the Carlsberg bottle, it's it's fun to look at. Consumers want to be seen with the bottle. And there is that element, isn't there, of, you know, you want to be seen to be making the right choices. Mm-hmm. I definitely think that's a thing. Like, people kind of get annoyed about wokeness and whatever else. But it's like, no, actually, I, I think that like Gen Z and to an extent millennials want to be seen to be making choices that are conscious and thought through and want to kind of say, oh, well, I've, I've bought this because of X, Y, and Z reason. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, maybe there's an element of wanting to show that you're aware and conscious, but sod it, mm-hmm. if that's going to help the planet tap into it. Yeah, exactly. Even this is just a really small example, but I've just recently... I've just noticed um, on Instagram, lots of like influencers and things like that are all using um, reusable cups and bottles and, and stuff like that. And they're actually in pictures with them. Like, a lot of them are like the, like the plastic, big like straw. It looks like a Starbucks, but it's a big gun. They're drinking water out of it. I'm seeing a lot of that happening. Um, mm. And that's just a really small, that's just literally what I think of at the top of my head. But it is, I think it is starting to become a bit more of a trendy thing. Which is good. But if it's a trendy thing that's good for the planet, then great. Exactly, Who cares? Exactly. Exactly. Because I think people are much more aware. I mean, God, it only takes one person to see, like, like you say, like one of those programs on plastics or Sea Spiracy or one of those documentary, and you're like, oh my God, I'm a terrible human for buying yeah. washing powder. <laughs> Which you're not, but. but you, it's, you make, it makes you feel terrible. Yeah. Well, look, Tom, thank you for being our guest. Uh, Super relevant with yesterday being World Earth Day. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll have even more on this topic.
A couple of years ago, Michael and Jacob, two friends from London, were both thinking about their consumption and sustainability as a whole. Michael, a professional footballer at the time, realised he had no options when it came to sustainable sportswear. Overconsumption and underuse was all too common. Hilo was born, a sportswear brand fighting for the planet by changing mindsets. They started with a running shoe made with seven natural materials, and the shoe can be recycled at the end of its life. As a company, they've offset their carbon to beyond zero, making them carbon negative. You can find out more about Hilo and support their mission at hiloathletics.com. That's H-Y-L-O. We support the Hilo movement. Right, Hayley. Uh, press release today. No, again, yesterday. I'm getting very confused. Um, World Earth Day. Uh, Climate Care is launching its carbon footprint of the internet infographic. Okay, so it's staggering how energy hungry the internet and the cloud is. For instance, our carbon footprint accounts, um, our digital carbon footprint rather, accounts for 3.7% of global greenhouse emissions, and that's set to double. Okay, so we will include in the show notes this infographic uh, so it, you can see um, what, what Climate Care have come up with. Um, but because of the fact that over 4 billion people are active internet users and internet traffic has tripled since 2015, um, yeah, we, you know, associated activity around computing is creating a huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, that is quite surprising, actually, that number. And like you say, it's only going to get worse because everything's becoming a lot more cloud based. I mean, even like the majority of our clients, everything's like cloud, cloud, cloud. By 2025, we want to be 80% on the cloud. Now, these are huge organizations that we're working with. And I'm guaranteeing that that's on a global scale. So it's like, oh, yeah. that doesn't even surprise me. Oh, it's- I mean, I have to, we have to be slightly kind of aware, uh, you know, creating a piece of content here that's going to sit on servers, that's going to sit on the cloud. And like, you know, content yeah. is is um, expanding exponentially. Um videos on you know tiktok uh youtube whatever else all these other platforms they all take hosting somewhere uh and it's yeah. it's wrong to say that we shouldn't be doing that and creating content but they have come up with 10 top tips for businesses and employees to help reduce their digital footprint okay right that's good i was going to say so how can we change it how can if it's going to double how can someone's got well, what steps can we today? take to Make you feel less like a rubbish human, right? Yeah. Uh, so these are the top 10. Switch off autoplay when using social media to avoid using a video if, if you, um, only if you need to. So uh, when you're scrolling on, um, on Instagram, because that stops the audio coming on. Right. And just simple steps like turning off the audio can reduce the amount of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, Close tabs you're not using to avoid videos playing in the background. So obviously if you're online and there's a, you know, you've got a news website, it's probably playing adverts or something in the background without you really realizing. Limit how often you use reply all to emails. Ah, oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Unsubscribe from newsletters you don't need to receive because then that email's not been generated. Shut down your computer if you're away from it for more than two hours. Um, I'm probably guilty of leaving my computer on sleep mode. I could just turn it off, so I'll yeah, make sure I do too. that. Um, consider storing your data on a green cloud provider. I wasn't even really aware to think about things like that. Neither did I. I didn't even know there was any. I was actually going to say that. I was going to say, is there's going to be got to be a greener way to use the cloud, and someone's going to come up with it. So who are they? Green cloud providers. We need to hear from you. Uh, dim your monitor. Dimming it from 100% to 70% can save 20% of the energy the monitor uses. Uh, be me, be mindful that even in sleep mode, a computer cont- continues to burn energy. Yep. Uh, hold on to IT equipment for as long as possible and get it repaired rather than buying a new device. So phone, you're going to be with me a little while longer. Uh, and be selective about the tech providers you work with and take time to review their environmental policies and actions. To be fair, I mean, apart from 10, which I suppose takes a little bit more time, you know, one to nine, you can do instantly and we'll help reduce the the digital footprint that you're creating yeah that is true and it's like just remembering these things i think and this is a thing i think with like our culture is that these things are so simple but will people actually do them like you'd I hope like so you don't, yeah you would like, oh you're going to remember to do them because you don't because you can't see what's happening in like 
to the environment and to the world because you can't see it firsthand because it looks like a lovely day out there and I've got plans this weekend and want to do mm. this and doing that and doing this because it's just not there for you to see. Especially in the Western world where like everything's glossed over. Um, yeah. I just think like people just forget about these small things that we can do and I feel like if we all just do it, just do it. Turn your laptop off tonight. Do you not put it in sleep mode because I am the guiltiest person for that. Then we're all doing our bit, aren't we? We are. There you go. So look, we'll, we'll, we'll attach a link to the infographic so that there is some visual representation and we don't want you to not enjoy your lovely weekend and, and go out in the sunshine and, and all of those things, but hopefully it's a visual reminder to do some of those steps and, and reduce the footprint that you're creating. Have a great time, but turn your laptop off. Turn your laptop off and dim your screen and turn off autoplay. There you go. Yeah. Um, right, Hayley, thank you very much for joining me. Enjoy your weekend. Give you the satisfaction